reason that the shepherd is to know the condition of the flock is not so that the shepherd can come in and condemn you or rebuke you when you're wrong, but that he may lead you back onto the right path with the words of God and by the grace of him. Amen. I believe that we as a church have grown somewhat complacent. Amen. I believe we as a body have gotten a little too comfortable, okay? And God doesn't call us to get comfortable on a mission. He calls us to get a little bit uncomfortable, to get a little bit perturbed by the things we see going around, to be difference makers, kingdom shakers, kingdom warriors. But I believe as we've seen with people uh, being let out of the Bible studies on Wednesdays and the things on Saturdays that go on and just trying to get, I believe what's happening is that we've grown complacent with coming into church on Sunday, listening to a message for an hour, going back to the old lives, and I'm going to let you guys know I won't cut it. Not because I'm saying I won't cut it, because the Word of God says that don't cut it, all right? We, we've gone through over and over the last several weeks the vision that God brought on him to highway, which is to be a body of repentance. Man, you guys should be saying this with me by now. Praise the Lord. To be a body of repentance and redeemed sinners. Penetrated the world we came from with the love and compassion of Jesus Christ and seeing lives transformed. Yep. If we're going to penetrate the world we came from, we have to have a transformed life. Before we can draw others in to have their lives transformed, our lives must be transformed. In other words, come in on Sunday not to take that away from you because that's a great thing. We're supposed to come in and learn together. We're supposed to come in and worship together. We're supposed to come in and praise together, rejoice together, suffer together. These are the things we are supposed to do, but it's more than just an hour on Sunday. It's a new life. It's a transformed life. And I really, I, I have to be honest with you guys, and I will always be honest. As I pray, and as I was fasting, and I was over going over these last several weeks, God has shown me that this is called to be a powerful body of Christ in Toledo. But the first thing that has to happen is we've got to get uncomfortable. We can't grow complacent. We can't grow stagnant. We can't continue doing the same things over and over. What's the definition of insanity? Anybody who's been to AA knows this one. Doing the same Say it again loud. Right. Doing the same thing over and over. We have to get uncomfortable, man. We can't be comfortable where we're at. Because the minute you become comfortable where you're at, you'll stop growing. And guess what? The minute you stop growing, you start dying. <coughs> All right, so I want to read to you out of the book of Revelation in chapter 2. Now understand the book of Revelation. Now this is New Testament stuff. Matter of fact, it's so New Testament that this book come out after the resurrection and after the ascension of Christ. Okay, this is Revelation that Jesus, after his receiving his glory, now gave this message to John. And it says in chapter 2, he tells him, Write to the angel of the church in, in Ephesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands, says, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found in them to be liars. You also possess endurance, and have tolerated many things because of my name and have not grown weary. And now listen, Jesus says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Amen. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus told the church at Ephesus, you have lost your first love. The most important thing. He said, I know all the works you're doing. I know that you can't stand evil in your house. I know that you're, you're striving and you're laboring for the glory of God. But 
all these and you missed the most important thing. You, you lost your first love. I wonder sometimes if maybe we might have done that. That maybe sometimes we get so busy doing ministry that we forget why and for who the ministry even comes from. If we may have possibly gotten so involved in wanting to see the world transformed, we forgot to go to the one who transformed us. In chapter 3, he says, write to another church, the church of Laodicea, in chapter 3, verse 14. And he says, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation says, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Whoa. <laughs> And now this is New Testament, all right? This is not the old wrathful God of the Old Testament that no longer exists because that God never did exist. The God that doesn't exist never existed. You hear what I'm saying to you? The God that didn't exist, we, we tend to say, well, that's Old Testament. God, the God of wrath, the God... My Bible, I don't know about yours. Yeah, I know about yours because it's the same as mine. My Bible says God is the same always, yesterday, today, and forevermore. All right? But this is New Testament, just for you, though, those of you that like to say, well, that's Old Testament, Pastor Rob. You know, this is New Testament. And he said that, I wish you were hot or cold, one or the other. But since you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Anybody want to be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord and God, Jesus Christ? I don't. And I believe that it's the same. It's because, you know, it, it, he says it right in here. He says, he goes on, and says, because you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy and need nothing. And I think that oftentimes, not that we're rich with money, but I think that oftentimes we've grown so comfortable with our lifestyle, we've grown so comfortable in our sin, that we think we don't need anything. When the truth is, we become lukewarm. Amen. And, and nobody wants to be that lukewarm Christian. So what I'm trying to bring to you today, like I said, I, I, I really didn't bring in many notes. I just want to, I want the Lord to speak to you through me today. If we're truly going to see the vision that God has given us, we have to understand the one who's given us the vision. The, the, the truth is we, don't, we can't completely understand God. He's not understandable. But that doesn't give us the right. See, what happens is we oftentimes come into the sanctuary during praise and worship. I'm going to tell you, man, sometimes I stand back and I look at people joking and laughing and talking and messing around during the time we're supposed to be praising God. And that doesn't make me angry with you. It makes my heart hurt for you because it tells me you really don't understand the God you stand before and who he is and how holy he is. So now that we just talked about not being in the Old Testament, let's go to the Old Testament and Isaiah. Amen. Isaiah chapter 6. We got to hear on this one a little bit last week from Brother Charlie, Deacon Charlie, give us a message out of this. It was a beautiful thing because God was speaking to me out of Isaiah 6. And I just knew when Charlie came up and said he was talking about holy. I knew it. And he said, the first thing he said, Isaiah 6. And I'm thinking, man, we must serve the same God, bro. <laughs> no question. Right. So in Isaiah chapter 6, I'm just going to begin reading in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on high and lofty throne, and his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. Amen. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, 
Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it, and he said, now that this has touched your lips, your wickedness is removed and your sin is atoned for. Praise the Lord. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who should I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, it's, don't you find it a little funny that that's how Isaiah starts this out? You know, he's about to talk about seeing the glory of God, and he starts out with saying, in the year that King Uzziah died. Why? Why would he say that? Well, first of all, how do we remember when things have happened? We, we don't we make a mental note. Well, you know, in the year that this happened, and we, we remember things that happened during that time, right? King Uzziah reigned for 52 years. Now look, in America, we have presidents for four years, maximum eight years. You, you know what I mean? Here was a king that reigned for 52 years, which for most of his reign was a good king. You know, he, he stumbled pridefully in the end there, but for most of his reign, he was a good king. The land was doing good. And in 52 years, this king reigned. And in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah starts this off with, because this had to have been a time that Isaiah was going through something. He must have been feeling and mourning the loss of this great king who had died. The one that was, he, for, for probably, you know, for most of the people in the land, this was the only king they knew. And he had, he was died. He had died. And so I can imagine Isaiah seeing who's going to oversee us now. Who's going to lead us now? Who's going to reign over the the land now? Now that our king of fifty two years is gone, what are we going to do? And so he marks us in the year that King Uzziah died, and he says, "I looked up and I saw the Lord high and lifted up." In this world, kings are going to come and kings will go. Presidents will come and presidents will go. Lords will come and lords will go. But there's one king who has been king forever and will never step down from the throne. And he is still on his throne today. And this is the same king that Isaiah saw when he looked up. And this tells me, this shows me that some of the things we have to understand is four things I've got written down. One is that we have an incomprehensibly great God. Amen. We have an incomprehensibly great God. Our God reigns. But sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we take that for granted. Sometimes we continue living life not remembering the one who has given us life. I love how he says in here that this that God was surrounded by these seraphim. The seraphim literally blazing angels. He was surrounded by these seraphim. Is it not a wonder that at any given time, these seraphim are, we don't know and by this scripture how many, but John in the book of Revelation, we were just saying, says thousands upon myriads upon multitudes of angels that are always and forever singing to the glory of God. This is, means that at any given time while you're working, while you're at work, while you're driving your car, while you're laying home in bed, while you're eating your dinner, while you're here on Sunday, and, and while I'm preaching at any given time, these angels are constantly singing to the glory. He is that holy. He is that glorious. He is that great that angelic beings are constantly praising and glorifying and singing to our God. And what are they singing? 
holy, holy, holy. It's as if they're trying to grasp some word that could accurately describe the glory of God. And all they can come up with is this holy word that they repeat over and over. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. For the whole earth is filled with his glory. He says that he has called the stars out, the starry host, and calls them each by name. And that he's so great and powerful that not one of them is lost. Scientists say, what, there's a hundred billion stars in our galaxy? At least. And that's just our galaxy. There's many, many other galaxies. And our God calls them each by name. There is not a speck of dust, a grain of sand, a drop of water that does not submit itself to the bidding of our God. And he has chosen us. I can't get over that. I don't know about you guys, but I can't get over that. This is our God, and he is indescribable. He is unexplainable. He is not fathomable. This is our God, and he cares for man so much that he made him just a little bit lower than angels. I can't get over that, brother. I don't know how you feel, man, but that is... You say, say that again. It's what? Awesome. <laughs> you know what? That is the only thing in this world that is awesome. Right. I was just talking with Laura on the phone yesterday and I said, you know what blows my mind? We use we have taken all the meaning out of that word awesome. You know? Honestly, oh Pastor Rod, that was an awesome message. I I listened to this awesome song. I watched this awesome movie. Do you understand that the word awesome at one time was specifically designed to describe God alone? The only one who is truly awesome. Awe-inspiring. Matter of fact, man, it's awesome that you said that. <laughs> In Psalm, uh, you, know, you don't have to turn there. I got it written down. I just want to tell you. But it, well, yeah, let's turn there. In Psalm uh, 47. Go ahead and turn there. We don't have anything else on the agenda, right? Right. Psalm 47. I love, I love what is the psalmist writes here. He says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a jubilant cry. For Yahweh, the Most High, is awe-inspiring, a great king over all the earth. Amen. In verse Five, it says, God ascends among shouts of joy. The Lord among the sound of trumpets. Sing praise to God. Sing praise. Sing praise to our king. Sing praise. Sing a song of wisdom, for God is king of all the earth. Amen. Hey, you know what? My verse says, he is awesome. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. <laughs> That's, man, we, and honestly, man, we say that over and over and over to where we, it's, it's like any other word. We say it so much, we, we lose the identity and we lose the meaning of the word. But, you know, like I was talking with Laura yesterday, she says, you know what, and, and he, she, he was convicting her of the same thing. She goes, I've been really careful trying to use that word because that word is described, is, is ascribed to describe God alone. Amen. For only he is awesome. Amen. <laughs> so, you know, this is the thing. Here's this. We, we have to get back. And I say that, you know, and as I was praying and saying, you know, God, I want to lead a people. I want to lead a people who will get back to understanding how great God really is. And he says, some of your people never did know. How can you get back to something you never knew? And I said, well, then, God, I want to lead a people into your glory. I want to lead a people to realize just how beautiful and magnificent and just how awesome you are. Amen. And he said, then go do it. <laughs> God is, we have a 
sovereign God and a scandalous gospel. Amen. We, really, we have a sovereign God and a scandalous gospel. God is sovereign over all things. He is sovereign over every life. He is sovereign over all nature. He is sovereign over all nations. In fact, let's, you know, I wasn't going to do this, but let's do it anyway. Go to Isaiah chapter 36. Now this was, you know, the, the, the book of Isaiah, it, 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 the, the contents of it t tells about Assyria, how, how it tells about how the northern kingdom had been destroyed and now the Assyrians are going around and taking over cities, right? And now they are going to the southern kingdom and in Assyria, 185,000 troops. That's a lot of troops in case you didn't know. That was 185,000 is a, a big number. 185,000 troops that had been conquering city after city, town after town, and how here's little Jerusalem, right? And all of a sudden, they're surrounded by this 185,000 strong army. And they, they had heard. They had heard how the Assyrians were taking over everything, how they'd been conquered after they heard this, and now all of a sudden they're surrounded by this 185,000, and their king, Hezekiah, starts telling them, trust God. Yes. You ever been in a situation where the stakes look impossible, and then you call Pastor Rob and he says, trust God, and it just sounds ridiculously stupid? Now, come on, because I've been there. Now, let's be honest in here. There's been times, some of you guys call me, and I say, trust God. And you just kind of, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for some advice. <laughs> that's my advice. Trust God. And that was King Hezekiah's advice. Trust God. So, we're in Isaiah chapter 36, and go to verse 23. This says, the king of Assyria, and he's mocking, and he's, he's, Let's just read it. It says, who is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I, 36. I said 36, right? Go to 36, verse 18. This is the king, um, the king of Assyria. And he tell, he's telling Jerusalem, he says, beware that Hezekiah does not mislead you by saying the Lord will deliver us. See, the, like I said, King Hezekiah was telling Trust God. Trust in the Lord. The Lord will deliver you. Yes, it looks crazy. Yes, it looks impossible. Yes, it looks like you're done and you're, you're dead and you can't go any further. He said, but the Lord will deliver you. And so the king of Syria, he laughs. He says, but where the Hezekiah doesn't mislead you by saying the Lord will deliver us. And listen, he says, has any one of the gods of the other nations delivered his land from the power of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvim? Have they delivered Samaria from my power? Who among all the gods of these lands ever delivered his land from my power? And so neither will the Lord deliver Jerusalem. <laughs> you should not have said that. You, have said that. you don't say that. He said, who will, I'm the king of Assyria. Who's going to deliver you out of my hands? Is there any God, is there any Lord who can deliver you? You don't say that. And, and so and so now God has something to say about this, right? Let's see what he has to say. Now go to chapter 37 and verse 23. And this is God now saying, who is it that you have mocked and blasphemed? Who have you raised your voice against and lifted your eyes in pride against the Holy One of Israel? You have mocked the Lord through your servants. You don't do that. You have said with my many chariots, I have gone up to the heights of the mountains, to the far recesses of Lebanon. I cut down the tallest cedars and choice cypress trees. I came to its distant heights, its densest forests. I dug wells and drank water. I dried up all the streams of Egypt, all the soles of my feet. And the Lord says this, have you not heard? 
I designed it long ago. I planned it in the days gone by. I have now brought it to pass, and you have crushed the fortified cities in the piles of rubble. Their inhabitants have become powerless, dismayed, and ashamed. They are plants of the field, tender grass, grass on the rooftops, blasted by the east wind. And God says this, but I know you're sitting down, you're going out, and you're coming in, and you're raging against me. And because of your raging against me and your arrogance have reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will make you go back the way you came. Them, brothers and sisters, are fighting words. And those are the words of our God. You don't mess with God. Go over to verse... Uh, 33, it says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or build an assault ramp against it. He will go back the way he came and he will not enter this city. This is the Lord's declaration. I will defend this city and rescue it because of me and because of my servant David. Then the angel of the Lord went out and listen and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and left <laughs> as well he should. Yep. <laughs> he returned home and lived in Nineveh. One day while well, he was worshiping in the temple of his god, Nisroch, his sons Adramelech and Sherezer struck him down with the sword and escaped to the land of Ararat. Listen, if there's one thing to take home with you today, is you do not underestimate the power of our God. Amen. And you don't mess with him. The second thing I want to talk to you guys about is that we, we, we have an incomprehensible great God and we are a sinfully depraved people. Every single last one of us. We are a sinfully depraved people. Did you notice in Isaiah 6 that when he saw the king sitting on his throne, he didn't say, wow. He said, whoa. <laughs> whoa is me. Going back to Isaiah 6. It says in verse 5, Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. We have to understand how guilty we are if we're ever going to understand how righteous he is. Amen. We have to know that we are a sinfully depraved people and we have not earned our way into his presence. We can't. It's impossible. None of us can earn our way in to God's presence. God is holy. We, we get so wrapped up in this, you know, God is love because he is. And now we talked about this a few weeks ago. God is love. But you know what? God is also just. God is righteous. God is holy. God can have nothing to do with sin. God is God is awesome. He can have nothing to do with sin, nothing to do with darkness. And here Isaiah is a man of God and, he, and, and a man who has being called to be a prophet for the holy God. And he gets it. He saw God up high 
lifted up and he says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I have no right to be here looking upon the glory of God. I have no right to see this. I am ruined, he said. Well, can we get to that spot to realize that we are ruined? Every one of us. Ruined. Because God is holy. We tend to water down not only the gospel, but also the wrath of God. God is a loving God. God is a wrathful God. God is a just judge, an avenger. He said, he, not that kind of avenger for you bikers. I know what you're thinking. God is the avenger, okay? <laughs> I've seen smiles out there when I say God's an avenger. No, he's not. <laughs> um, yeah. He's going to be a coffin? Right on, man. I, <laughs> I don't know, man. He got it. So see, we have to get this though, man. We have, listen, I, I want, like I told you, I want to lead a people into understanding the awesomeness of God. And for us to truly understand how awesome he is, we have to realize just how wretched we are. How we have done nothing to earn our way into salvation, into the glory of God. We have to realize that we are ruined. Like Isaiah said here. Brother, that's what I do. I was saved, but I knew there was Absolutely, man. There is no good thing. Virginia read it right from the text itself today up here. Nothing, nothing good lives in me. Listen, I might be your pastor, but I'm going to tell you, my man, I will let you down. I will let you down. Don't show up here because Pastor Rob. Show up because God is the one who will never let you down. I won't stand up here and pretend to be perfect in front of you. I'm not. I'm wretched and I'm a ruined man. We 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 we, we, <laughs> we water down who God really is. You know there are some punishments, man, all throughout Scripture that seem extreme to us, and not just in the Old Testament and the New Testament too. Think of Ananias and his wife. They lied. They lied to the Holy Spirit, and they were struck dead right on the spot. This is New Testament. There's some punishments that seem very extreme to us. If, if we can be honest with ourselves. We wrestle with these things, don't we? Don't we wrestle with that when we read in Scripture that Ananias dropped dead because he lied? I mean, I've had people lie to me, but I don't think they deserve to die because of it. I might have wanted to make them sometimes, but I never did. <laughs> and we, we, we wrestle. We have to wrestle with this. We, have to, we can't understand it all. I think of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament. Yeah, they had some wicked things going on. They had some evil stuff going on in the country. Look at America. Amen. Look at America. That's true. But you know, I think of that. He rained brimstone down on the people. And then let's think of Lot and his wife. They were fleeing. And God said, don't look back. Well, his wife just, just took this one glimpse back. One glimpse. And poof, she was turned into a pillar of salt. Disintegrated because of a glance. Think of a man in Leviticus who was picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And they, they, went, to, they went to God and said, what should we do with him? And he said, stone him. Stone. Now, when I tell sorry, I say stoned, we're not talking about the good kind of being stoned, okay? This is, they, we're talking about having stones thrown at you. For picking up sticks. We underestimate not only the power of God, but the holiness of God. The righteousness of God. The glory of God. We have to be able to come before God and say, woe is us. Then you take it all the way back to the very beginning. Adam and Eve in the garden, right? 
One sin, right? One sin. They ate the fruit. And because they ate the fruit, because of this one sin, the whole world has been cursed. That because of the one sin, there's now disease, and there's cancer, and, and there's there's child, there's fatherless children, and there, all these things, they all stem back from one sin. And in this room, we've committed thousands of sins. Woe is us. For we are a people of unclean lips and do not deserve to see the glory of God. The next thing we have to understand is that we have, like I said, a scandalously merciful Savior. In the scriptures, in Isaiah 6, it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your wickedness is removed and your sin is atoned for. How is that possible? God is this holy, righteous, wonderful, awesome God who can have nothing to do with sin. And I, I want to I not miss this point too. Not only you know, these angels were singing holy, 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 right? But not only is God I lost myself here. Not only is God though uh, without error not only is God without sin, not only is God, that's not why the angels sing holy, holy, holy. Not just because he's without error or without sin, because the angels themselves that were singing to him are without error and without sin. They weren't part of humanity. They weren't part of the fallen angels. They were without error and without sin too. But God is not only without error, he's also without equal. There is nothing and no one greater that even these seraphim, these blazing angels were singing praise to his name and they, they are unsinful. They don't have, they have not gotten mingled with darkness like we have. I wanted to make that point to you because now we go to this, you know, we have this scandal. How is this possible? We are even, we shouldn't even be able to come into the presence of God where these angels are singing how holy he is. Here is a guilty man. Isaiah is a guilty man. Fallen like the rest of us. How can a guilty man stand before a holy God and God looks a minute at this guilty, wrong man and says, innocent. That's scandalous, man. How is that possible? How can he look at a, at, at a man who is wrong and say, right? How, how can he look? But you know what? That doesn't say that right here. Right here, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. It was the act of God himself that took away the guilt. There was the act of God himself that atoned for the sins. Isaiah could do nothing. He was a wretched fallen man and here he stood before God. And you're right, he, he came to a spot where he realized he needed a savior. He saw the glory of God. And he said, I'm an unclean man. And so how is this possible? You know, like I said, this is a scandalous, scandalous gospel. <laughs> Let's think of, you know, how many people have heard of Rolls Royce? The one car that what? Claimed that their cars would never break down, right? <laughs> so here's Rolls Royce. They said their cars never break down. And they, I think they were, I think they shipped a the car overseas. A man had bought a Rolls Royce and he was overseas. And he's driving a car and guess what? It breaks down, right? So he calls Rolls Royce up on the phone. He tells me his car's broken down. They say, hey, 
immediately they put the mechanic on the plane, they sent the plane over to him, the mechanic immediately fixed the car, got on the plane, came back home. The guy waits around for a while for his bill from Rolls Royce and the bill never shows up. So finally, he's wanting to make things right, get this and put it behind him, so he calls Royce with Rolls Royce company up and he says, hey, I want to pay this bill, get it taken care of, I haven't heard anything from you. And the operator or whoever it was gets on the line and says, well, we're sorry, sir, but we have absolutely no record of anything ever going wrong with your car. <laughs> Scandalous. That's scandalous. They, now they get to continue saying their car never broke down. Right. How beautiful is it that we have a God who looks at you and says, I'm sorry, but I have absolutely no record of anything in your life ever going wrong. Amen. That is a scandalous gospel. It's scandalous mercy. And only a holy God can do something like that. Hmm. This picture is what we get in Isaiah 6 of the, of, of the seraphim taking this coal from the altar, a sacrifice, if you will, from the altar to atone for Isaiah's sins. But it's an incomplete picture of what we have experienced. In Isaiah 53, we see a more complete picture of this scandalous gospel. You know, sometimes I struggle with saying what God wants me to say because I don't want to, I'm human. I don't want, I want to be liked. It's like every person does, I want to be liked. And so sometimes God is telling me to say something I don't really want to, but I have to. And we are a church that we, we have continuously over the last few years, um, Debuddled, is that the right word? Many of these Christian sayings that go on, like, God will never give you more than you can handle. Debunked. Debunked, thank you, that's what I'm looking for. We, there's another one, and there's one that I think probably most of us, if not all of us, have said. And it's, God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Not that that's not true, but that's only a half truth. I feel because I've said this to a few people and I get kind of a startled reaction, but I have to bring this out to you. Go ahead and stay in Isaiah 53. I'm going to turn and read to you real quick from a, a verse from Psalm 5. And then we're going to see it in Isaiah 53. In Psalm 5, verse 5. It says, the boastful cannot stand in your presence. You hate all evil doers. You destroy those who tell lies. You, the Lord abhors a man of bloodshed and treachery. You can argue with me, but I didn't write that. Does God love the sinner? Yeah. But he also hates the sinner. It's in the scripture. Maybe to put it a little softer for you, I should use that other word he said, abhor. God abhors the wicked. He abhors the sinner. But it is in scripture. And this is what I want you guys to see today is how almighty and powerful God is that he can use his hatred towards sin and sinners and his love Toward sinners and bring them to the cross in a way that no one other than God could possibly have done. In Isaiah chapter 53, in verse 4, 
yet he himself bore our sickness. You might want to circle or underline everywhere in here where it says our or we because I want you to get this. It's not just that Jesus went to the cross to die for sin, but it was for the sinner. It was for you and it was for me and that he actually took our sin to the cross. He says, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Amen. Here you see a picture of God's hatred toward not just the sin, but the sinner. Because we tend to look at sin from a man's perspective, like as if it was something outside the body, something that we do. But the truth is sin is at the core of who we are. We were conceived. We were born into sin. We are all made up of sin. It's at the core of who we, let me say this, of who we were. Because we now live a new life in Christ. But it is at the core of who we were. We, we tend to explain it away by saying that sin is just the things we do. But it's not. Sin is who we were. Sin was not just outside the body, but inside the body. And so that's why I'm saying circle. Every time it says we and our, because I want you to get this. It's not for our exterior sins that Jesus died for, but it's for who we were that Jesus had to die. Because God hates the sin and he hates the sinner. He can't have nothing to do with wickedness or darkness or sin. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. You know, I think about this. It says in the chapter before that that they actually pulled his beard out, spat on him, and whipped and beat him. And I'm thinking, I don't know how much of that I would have took before I started fighting back, man, cursing him out. And you know what I'm saying? And he went all the way through this with you on his mind. Why? We're guilty people, man. We don't deserve that. He went through all this without even opening his mouth, it said. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man at his death. Although he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. <clears throat> Jesus took the punishment that we so rightly deserve. And he did it with you on his mind, knowing, knowing that he was suffering the wrath of God that he never deserved. I've heard it once said like this, Jesus was treated the way we deserved so that we could be treated by him the way Jesus deserves. That is deep and powerful. And so now you see the cross. And you see that because of God's hatred and wrath towards sin and sinners, you see the cross that we were all headed to. The wrath, the punishment that we all deserved. And then you see in verse 10 it says, Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him. 
Wait a minute. The Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a restitution offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. He will see it out of his anguish and he will be satisfied with his knowledge by my righteous servant will justify many and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion and he will receive the mighty as spoil because he submitted himself to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. So now you see this cross again and you see how God's hatred brings about the cross, the necessity of the cross. And then you see how God's love for sinners brings out the cross. Can you see it with me? Can you see how at the cross, God's love for us and his hatred toward our sin come together at the cross that he provided the sacrifice that you did not have to be crucified? The way things worked in the Old Testament in, in, in years long ago is that they would bring in, they would raise up a, a goat or a lamb in their home, and they, they'd get close to it. It'd almost probably be like a pet. And then come the day of sacrifice, they would sacrifice that animal. Death. Death in place of their sins, right? Well, and then there would be this goat an escape goat, or scapegoat, however you say, that the priest would lay his hands on its head. And it was a picture of the people's sin, leaving them and going into this goat. And then the goat would be taken outside the camp. And it would be taken into the wilderness, never to be seen again. And it carried the people's sins with it. So that their sins were removed from them. Their sins were removed from the camp. Are you seeing it now? Jesus is our scapegoat. The only one who could have paid the sacrifice for all time. And because God has this great love for us. But he also is holy and just and right. And has to pour his wrath out on evil. He provided his son as a sacrifice so that we can actually stand in his presence and see the awesomeness and the glory and the praise due God that we don't deserve to be at. So my prayer is that we as a body, as a family, and as a church can see Remember, or maybe see for the first time just how beautiful and awesome. Because without this, you guys, nothing else is worth anything. Yes. And if and with this, when you can get to this spot, trust me in this. This will motivate you to want to learn more about your God. This will motivate you to want to be in unison with the holiness of God. This will make you want to be his servant. Isaiah, the last thing I want to share with you is this. He, that we have an urgent mission. Isaiah's reply after being cleansed was the only possible reply after a guilty man being called innocent by a holy God. And it was, here I am, Lord, send me. And when we get to understand just how real, how powerful, how glorious, how great and how awesome God is. And then he paid the sacrifice to atone for our sins. We will not have any other response than here I am, Lord, send me. Amen.